Hi, folks, and welcome. We're going to be starting in just a few minutes. Thanks for joining. Hi, folks, and welcome. It is the start of the hour, so we are going to go ahead and get started. I am Dr. Joanne Yanez, I'm the Executive Director for the Association of Accredited Naturopathic Medical Colleges. Welcome to our talk today on residencies. Uh, next slide, please. So just a quick heads up, this is just an educational webinar only, not intended for anything more than informational purposes. Next slide. So uh, everyone just kind of heads up is in listen only mode. If you do have questions and we encourage questions, uh, please use the Q&A box in Zoom, uh, which is down on your control panel. Uh, we'd prefer not to use chat just because Q&A is a bit easier for us to manage the questions on the back end. Uh, and it, this will be recorded, so if you miss any part of it or you want to go back and revisit something, the recordings will be sent out when the link is ready. And of course, if you have any questions or issues, uh, please email us at either residency at aanmc.org or events at aanmc.org. Uh, and so with that, next slide. So just a real quick introduction uh, to what we are talking about today. Uh, So we're going to be going through the residency application process, uh, some tips for you to create a strong application uh, in general match. We'll talk about residencies across borders and so on, creating a new residency process, and then the match and post-match uh, situation. So with that, uh, I will introduce our panel. I already know you know who I am. Uh, we have Dr. Gary Garcia from Bastyr. We have Dr. D. Saunders from NUNM. Dr. Carino from CCNM and Dr. Barnett from Sonoran University. And with that, I will turn this over to Dr. Garcia. Thank you, Dr. Yanis. Um, so let's see, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, wherever you are. And um, so as what Dr. Yanis had mentioned earlier, um, this is to give you an idea of the coming application. We've had actually two phases to the application. Phase one, of course, was during the month of October all the way up to the up to this month of January. So you said you should have been doing some prep um, during that period of time. And just as a summary, it, uh, you should have at least created a portal um, profile in the residency portal. And you should at least have visited some of the current clinics that have been approved for um, that have been hosting residencies. And you should also should have begun 
putting together at least your resume, your personal statement. And one of the key things, of course, is that you should have already registered your credit card. Uh, just a reminder that um, your card doesn't get charged until the application deadline. So, uh, so it doesn't cost you anything until you actually submit the application and the deadline is over. Now, we're about to embark into the phase two of the um, of the application period. And that, of course, begins this month of um, coming month of February. So on February 1st, um, this is when the um, different residency directors, myself and my counterparts will um, um, submit the different um, clinical sites that are gonna be hosting residencies this coming cycle. And of course, it is during this actual period when you are supposed to be submitting applications and so it's really important that you're fully aware of all the different timelines from the recent interviews and as well as the match. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a reminder, you know, we, um, Simplicity is now available to uh, through through your through your phone. So always good to just have this um, handy dandy app in your um, in your um, phone and make sure you download this. Next slide, please. And of course, once you have created your account, always good to just uh, check on the resources. Resources actually has um, two key areas that um, I'll really highlight here. One is the featured tools, which is the application checklist. As you can see, it's highlighted by that arrow over there. The application checklist is, is not a requirement, but it's a helpful guide. It's sort of a roadmap that makes sure that you actually are hitting all the key steps. Now, the other, um, the other um, resource that we have here, of course, is a documents library. The documents library is really, really important here because it contains several documents, including the residency timelines, the, uh, the instructions on how to put together your resume, um, the guidelines on, on the interview process, the match process. It also gives you a sample of the evaluation tool. It's not the actual tool that you're supervisor will be filling out, but at least it gives you an idea of, of the evaluation that they're gonna be submitting. Next slide, please. So again, um, just, as a, um, just as a summary, if you will, um, phase one was in the month of October all the way up to, the, uh, up to January. We had already um, some of these events uh, that, that was hosted earlier. And of course, we are about to embark on uh, phase two starting February 1st. And um, in this particular side, it's really important to pay attention to, to, the, to the key deadlines. You have Feb the February 28th deadline, which is for your faculty evaluators and your school to submit your school transcripts. And then of course, the next deadline would be the sub your submission of your credential order to the residency committee so that the committee can put together that in a confidential um, file. And of course, uh, March 13th is the actual submission deadline of your, of your applications. Um, Dr. Saunders is going to um, explain this a little bit more um, in, in, the, in the coming slides. So that's key. And then of course, um, once you submit a deadline, um, note that the application, the interview period is actually from April 1st to May 8th. The key thing to remember here is that it doesn't mean that on April 1st, all the sites are gonna be calling you in for interview. It's it's just a a, a date that, set, that informs the site, you can begin interview at this time. I know several sites will be on their different, um, uh, you know, interview cycle. So um, if you haven't heard, heard from a site, maybe for a, for a couple of weeks, always just good to follow up with them and just make sure they actually receive your application. So that, and that'll also sort of prompt them to, to make sure that, um, that um, not only have they received your application, but also that also give them an opportunity to, to, um, to review your application if they haven't done so yet. And of course, the interview period ends on May 8th and um, you have about a week to, um, to put together your match list. That's also the match list that the individual sites are also gonna be submitting to the residency committee. And of course, the publication of the match results is on May the 24th. Next slide. Okay, um, I'll give this to Dr. Hand over this to Dr. D. 
Thank you, Dr. Garcia. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, and I apologize in advance if you hear a small puppy crying. Um, she's not happy that, that I'm not giving my whole weekend to her. Um, so I'm here to talk about some of the activities of phase two. And like Gar Dr. Garcia said, there were things that should have been done or that you could have been working on during phase one. And I just want us to say, hopefully you did knock out some of those, but if for some reason you didn't and weren't really thinking you were gonna do a residency and now you're a little bit more curious, I'm just gonna say you have a little bit more to catch up on in terms of activities in addition to what I'm gonna go over. It's completely doable, um, but I just wanna to separate those two things out. So as an overview on February 1st, we'll be posting all of the sites that are committed to hosting a, a residency for the 2024-25 residency year. Um, you'll log in, you'll view them. There are some ways to sort by, uh, by state of what you might be looking for. You wanna read closely in the the what they're actually looking for when the due date is to make sure this is actually an open position for this year's match and not a current open position for an already licensed resident. So that's, or I'm sorry, uh, a physician. Second, you'll wanna request your faculty evaluations and school transcripts. And uh, Dr. Garcia pointed out that the due date for faculty to complete these was, is February 28th. So you're looking at between February 1st and February 28th, a nice four weeks of robust time. Please do yourself a solid and your evaluator and get your requests in as soon as you can. You could have been requesting these evaluations during our phase one as well. So really the last thing you wanna do is wake up the third week of February and decide you want to apply to a residency and start asking faculty then. Um, as you know, your faculty are busy and you don't really wanna miss your deadline. Uh, when you request your evaluations, this is all done uh, from the portal on the top right-hand corner, you'll see your initials. So when I log in, I see DS and I click on the DS and scroll down to orders and transcripts. And so that's basically what I'm talking about now. You would pop into that section and uh, enter your faculty's email and the system will take it from there. The system will send over a request and send a link uh, for the faculty to fill out your evaluation. So you don't need to send a PDF, you don't need to send anything to them, you need to go into the portal, put in their email, and the system will take care of everything else. And then you can check back in to see if your, if your evaluations have been completed. And if they haven't, it's a good idea to poke your faculty and follow up with them. And also this is where you get your school transcript. So you'll type in your registrar's email, make sure that they have uploaded that as well. Uh, during this time, you'll be finalizing all your documents, uploading your personal statements, resumes, essays, and your NPLEX 1 scores. I'll say if you haven't taken or passed NPLEX 1 at, at this juncture, but are planning to in February, you just need to upload a document that says you are planning to take it in February and you because you will not have your results by the time applications are due. And that's okay. Um, but if you haven't, if you're not taking it in February, then you won't qualify for any of these positions because you have to have MPLEX 2 taken in August and be licensed by October. With your personal statements, resumes, and essays, I highly recommend you make them custom to your site that you are applying to and upload them into your document library as such. So think of the portal as a repository for all of your things. So I would label Saunders, NUNM, personal statement, Saunders, NUNM, resume, right? Or, or your resume might be the same for all of the schools that you apply to, but certainly my essays for a teaching school might be different than my essays for a site that really focuses on women's health. You want to be able to highlight your skills uh, as they apply to the residency that you're um, choosing to apply for. So after or while you are working on uploading all your statements for the sites you are interested in, once your evaluations and transcripts are all in the completed tab, you won't be able to see them because they're confidential documents. You need to create a credentials order, and that is a confidential compiling of all of those documents into one single document that's placed back in your library that you can upload and will need to upload for each application. And this is done in the same area as when you went to go request your evaluators and your transcripts. 
So you find your initials in the top right corner, scroll down to re recommend the orders and transcripts, and then you click the orders tab and you'll fill out your order, creating um, four documents, your transcript, and then three evaluations. Talk a little bit more about that. Um, you'll su submit your application documents to each site in the, uh, by, the de by the deadline, and then prepare for your interviews and prepare to match. Next slide, please. Okay, so a little bit more about that. I was getting ahead of myself. You you only want to create one document, one order. Uh, most of you will only need one order. So this is where you get three evaluate your three completed evaluations and your transcript and ask. You're basically asking the system to uh, put it all together into one, make it confidential, and put it back into your library so that you can apply. Now, for a few of you that might be applying to a school residency, in addition to an off-site residency, you may do two orders if and only if one of your evaluators is also on your interview board at your school. So if I was going to apply to NUNM and I really wanted one of my faculty there to write an evaluation for me, and they're also on the interview committee, I really wouldn't be able to ask them to do that, but I might want their evaluation for some offsites that I'm applying to. So in that particular case, you can create two orders and you just wanna label your order correctly. So if I was going to apply to a school and then apply to an offsite in the scenario that I just gave, so only if your evaluators are also part of your interview committee, I will label it Saunders and UNM order, and then Saunders offsite order or whatever um, nomenclature you want to choose. But that way, when the documents get made and put back into your library, you'll be able to select the correct one when you go to apply. Next slide, please. Um, so how to submit it? I talked a little bit about that. The credentials tab is no longer actually on the left-hand menu bar. Um, it is going to be, again, in your um, initials on the top right-hand corner. I would click on DS and do a drop-down, and that's where you'll find orders and transcripts. And then it's pretty easy to follow the tabs. Everything else there is, is the same. There's an orders tab. There's a credentials tab. Uh, and then there's a um, completed tab so that you're able to see what is complete. And I will also uh, say you'll see this um, in the note section that when you go to complete your order, if you don't uh, upload the right number of documents, then your order will not be processed. So sometimes we get questions like, well, can I get five evaluators or can I turn in four evaluators? And the answer is no, you can turn in three evaluators and one transcript and your NPLEX. So what you'll wanna do is make sure that you put in the right number of documents. And I believe that might be it. Next slide, please. Oh, one more, okay. You may, okay, I have discussed this, a maximum of two orders. If you have any questions about that, really reach out to, it'll just be the folks at Sonoran, Bastyr, and NUNM, if one of your evaluators is actually on the residency committee. Okay, next slide, please. And over to Dr. Barnett. Thank you, Dee. So other key items. Each job you applied for is $49. And uh, you want to consider the cost of travel for interview if that is required. And usually that, um, that cost is on you. So plan for that. Maybe you want to do a little extra investigation before incurring that expense. More than what you might do before applying um, for the $49 application fee. Um, some sites require that you preceptor or at least visit them for eligibility to even apply. So you might wanna read their posting very carefully. And if you're not sure, you wanna double check, you might wanna just contact them, at least email them. Um, then you incur a $50 match fee. So that's for all of them. That's just to participate in the match. So it's $50 plus $49 for each application. That's the total. Next slide. How decisions are made is complex and varied from place to place and from job to job. Grades, research, and honors track, et cetera, 
may weigh more for one degree experience, evidence of passion in some area may matter more for another. So it depends. Recommendations are almost always very helpful. Um, I mean, toward the top of the list. Um, you're, you are or may not be invited for an interview, but you will be contacted by the site about that one way or the other. If it goes too long, uh, please contact one of us. Um, we'll f investigate that to see if something slipped between the cracks because it has before. Um, next slide, please. All right, uh, interview tips. I would say this is probably the most important piece of all. If you've got this far, um, then it becomes the most important, I dare say. Um, it could be virtual, it could be in person. Uh, professionalism is the most important thing about it. So come prepared to shine and spotlight your strengths. Um, make sure that if you're doing it virtually that you have a professional background, that you're, you know, you can be uh, somewhat casual without being, without losing that professionalism and show you're comfortable with, with yourself. Uh, sure, a good internet connection, that's very important. And I highly recommend maybe doing a little test connection ahead of time. Uh, for example, if it's a school, maybe connect with the, the residency director, half hour, 20 minutes or something beforehand, make sure everything's working right, that you have a reliable connection, um, that everything's right. And, and often we have a little prep. There'll be a, a little prep ahead of time so you're ready. Um, dress appropriately. Make sure your dog is in the backyard or something like that so that everything goes smoothly. All right. Um, Next slide, please. Uh, competitiveness varies based on the role and uh, the different backgrounds that you might have, different experiences. It really is, um, it really is a, about a fit. I've, I've harped on this before. I think fit is is really important, uh, more important than any single factor. Probably, it it needs to be a good fit for things to go well for the whole year or more, depending on the time of your residency. So. It's just so varied, it's hard to comment on. So it, it, it gets back to that shining on your strengths to show that you're a good fit. Your CV is like your abstract, um, then from which you make like an elevator speech, but on a, at, a, at a higher level where you, you this is your impression. Um, and then it can go off of that so where you can elaborate in an interview and, um, and, and you know, reinforce those good things about yourself. So make sure that your CV is really nice and clean and is a launching pad for you to talk about yourself and highlight yourself and to show that you're a good fit. Um, position to position matters. So it's not like um, a generic application fits for everything. So you want to tailor it to, to um, the job and just to show that you're a better fit than anybody else that might be applying. Plan ahead. That's that's about all I have to say now. Great. So you've gone through all the things that you've needed to do in order to prepare yourself for this application process. You have thought good and hard about what you want in your personal statements. You have um, also gathered uh, the material that's required to apply, uh, including faculty evals and the resume. Uh, you've gone through the interview process and you are now um, in a position to, to judge and to make a decisive decision about what residency you want to be in. So um, what you you will receive is a particular, it, it will be an email as well as it'll show up as a communication in the portal, um, the, a, a separate match um, link where you will then be able to decide your ranking. And so you need to think long and hard about which residency you want to apply to and that you would are willing to work for or work with based on the fit, as Dr. Barnett had suggested, uh, that you see yourself um, thriving in. So with that in mind, you please um, submit the names of the sites that we, you've interviewed for. And if you decide to only apply to one, and this the, one of the um, reasons I'm saying this is even if you've applied to one, you still need to ensure that you 
that you put in a match. Because if you don't, it's not assured that you will, well, it's you, you won't even register on the match list. So make sure that you that you um, get into the match uh, and that you have um, ranked what uh, position that you would like to apply to. And that opens on May the 8th, and then it closes May 15th at 8 p.m. Eastern time. There is a separate fee, it's $50, and so make sure that you do so. Um, and just so you know, if you decline the position, that you have been matched for, you cannot reapply for residency for two years. Next slide, please. So we're often asked about uh, different residencies that are cross borders. So I just wanted to give you an outline of what to anticipate. Um, there are Canadian citizens uh, wanting to apply to American um, residencies and vice versa. And, uh, I just want you to realize that there are some barriers in order for a smooth um, transition and opportunity, and for the opportunity to be as open as it would perhaps normally would if you were, um, you know, doing it within uh, your local area. Um, it's complicated. It's time consuming, and we also have, uh, you know, experience of residency sites that have accepted folks across border, and it often caused a delay in their start and so it may discourage them from actually accepting your application. There are time delays and there's a cost associated with that and, and unfortunately that is um, put on the put on the uh, resident applicant uh, to obtain in terms of the legal costs. So um, not that we're going to necessarily discourage you from doing that but I just want you to be aware of what some of the upfront challenges uh, that you will face in doing so. It is not an impossible situation though, because we've certainly had residencies cross border, uh, um, but that is something to take into consideration. Next slide, please. So um, this slide is titled cross border residencies, but it doesn't just apply to cross border residencies. This, ref this refers to refunds. And so the first is the site accepted you in the match, but the visa work permit delays have forced them to accept the next candidate, you will not be refunded. Uh, you originally applied and interviewed a site at, at a site, but decided you, the applicant, were not interested in including, including the site in the match. Um, and that is true for cross-border residencies and elsewhere. Um, you will not be um, refunded. The site interviewed you, but decided to match with someone else, you will not be refunded. The site interviewed you, but decided not to match a residence in the cycle. You will not be in, um, you will not be refunded, and the site does not offer you an interview. You will not be re refunded. So um, just take that into consideration. Uh, at the same time, you will uh, have a lot of opportunities where you will have um, residency hosts asking for you to interview for them. So take heart and I uh, good luck on your application. Next slide, please. So for those sites that were not matched and would like, uh, so post-match applications do occur. So as, as the, the match occurs and perhaps you hadn't um, matched with, this, with, with the site that you had ranked, um, or there are other sites that uh, didn't, um, uh, match with the applicant that they had uh, wanted, then there will be sites that will need to fill their positions. So please look at the um, new sites. They will um, continue to show up on the um, on on the in the portal. And so just keep an eye out on that. Uh, Post match residencies are available to you. Next slide, please. So as a recap, there's a few things to do within the next several weeks. Do your due diligence, view the available residency positions in open residencies. And as mentioned before, in the coming weeks, uh, starting in phase two, like so keep an eye out, you'll see a whole bunch of residency sites that will be um, opened up and you'll be able to see what's available. So keep an eye out on that. Uh, ensure that you follow up in faculty evaluation. So yes, once you put in the request for a faculty eval, uh, they will receive a link um, 
as you all know, faculty can be quite busy and it might show up and they might start it and then they will have forgotten it and then they wouldn't have pressed the submit button. So it is uh, nice to kind of follow up for them as well as the school transcript. Make sure that you've worked on your personal statement resume essays and got gathered the information for NPLEX 1 um, and uh, create an order for your confidential credential file. This is often a very busy time, so make sure that you have done all of that. Uh, also, I just wanted to comment, make sure whether it be um, in the um, in, in your application, make sure that your email is up to date, uh, make sure that uh, your credit card is up to date, make sure everything is up to date so that everything can be processed uh, well enough in advance. Um, submit your application documents for each site by the deadline, prepare for your interviews and prepare your match list. Thank you, Dr. Carino. Uh, so we're just about ready to wrap up here and go into question and answer. Uh, if, if you are interested or you need more information, uh, take a screenshot of this page. The residency FAQs have a lot of good information. Our YouTube channel has a lot of the uh, site videos that sites have done. I believe we've got about 33, 35 sites or so uh, with videos up about them. And uh, we also have some residencies who have decided to share a little bit more about their, uh, their experiences on our Instagram account. Next slide. Uh, and just, just a little plug for AANMC events. Uh, as some of you may have remembered from when you were applying to naturopathic programs, AANMC hosts free events for folks considering the profession. And so we've got a few coming up. If you have any uh, friends from college or family members or folks in your circle who may also be interested in becoming a naturopathic doctor. Uh, so please deliver them over to our events page. And uh, there are some really good resources for prospective students. If you can remember back that far for yourself. Next slide. All right. So we are going to turn over into question and answer time now. Uh, I know we have been answering some questions along the way. Thank you to the committee members for doing that and staying on top of the questions. Uh, so I see one here uh, about filtering. So uh, to the anonymous attendee who's just asked about open residency positions, uh, reminder that we, we said that the open positions are going to be open this week for the upcoming cycle. So the only sites that you'll see as open uh, for this cycle right now are the off is one off cycle site in Arizona. So please stay tuned when this opens February 1st. This is just kind of a precursor uh, so that we can hit the ground running. So I hope that answers your question for you regarding uh, what sites you're seeing. All of the sites will land as open when we open the actual application portal. Uh, there is a question from uh, somebody regarding the match process. Would someone like to explain how match works? Maybe I can start because I'm the one that talked about it. Uh, and then feel free committee members to just fill in where I might've left off. So after the interview process, after everything has occurred, then the residency hosts are asked to submit their ranked lists of candidates that they would be willing to accept within the um, within their residency. And uh, so that will be received by the committee. Uh, and then there's also um, the receipt of the um, applications that have been um, submitted by, or the ranking that would have been submitted by you, the, the applicant. Um, what happens is we look for a one-to-one -one match of the residency host with the, um, oh, sorry, <laughs> with the with the resident um, applicant, uh, and that makes it quite easy when that occurs. Um, you know, first choice, first choice, wonderful. That can be that can be put aside. Um, and uh, so then the the question sometimes is, what if two residency um, sites have chosen or have selected one um, individual as their top choice? Well, then we look at the top choice of that resident applicant, and uh, then we will defer to the resident applicant. 
So um, it, it just continues on down the line and we, we look to see how we can match uh, everyone based on fit, based on preference. And um, that is generally how the match goes. Um, is, does anyone else have anything to add to that? Can I add to that, uh, Dr. Carino? Um, just to remind everybody, um, the actual description of the match process, if you're really wanting to get into the nits and grits on how actual matching occurs, um, I'll encourage you to visit the resources tab. And um, of course, under the resources tab, you'll, you'll, you'll be able to um, go and download your, um, in the documents library, you'll be able to actually download the actual description. And I'll highly encourage everybody to do that so that you can, um, can have an idea of how the match actually occurs. And at the same time, it also gives you some some tips, if you will, in terms of what to expect during the actual interview. Um, and yeah, so I'll encourage you to just download that. Uh, make sure that you're aware of um, of of the interview questions and of the match process. It gives you really more granular detail um, regarding um, how the match process actually works. Thank you. Uh, so there are a few other questions that are coming in. Uh, uh, from just to follow up on the match with uh, Jillian. So even if you have something as your second choice, you could potentially get it. So yes, Jillian, do not, and I will say this so very, very emphatically, do not put down any site on your match rank list that you would not be willing to take a residency position at. If it is, If you list a site as ranked for matching, you have to be okay with going there. So, so if you've interviewed, so let's give a scenario. So let's say that you interview with three sites, two of those sites are, you know, you would be happy to accept a position and one of the other ones is just not gonna be a good fit for what you're looking for. Do not put that site down on your match list because if you do get ranked uh, and matched with that site, that and you choose to not accept it, you will be banned from residency match for two years, as Dr. Carino had said. So I hope that is clear. Uh, nobody is going to be matched to any site that you have not selected. No site is going to be matched to a student that they have not ranked. So I hope that that is clear. The sites rank the students, the students rank the sites, the residency uh, conf committee confidentially goes through the 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 one to one matches, the one to two matches, and so on. But if you have not put down a site, and or they have not put down you, you will not be matched to a site that you have not listed. I hope that's clear. Okay. Uh, next question: uh, What happens when the only doctors we have worked with are on our residency panel at our school or applying to? Who would like to take that? I'll take it. Um, well, that if all of your rotations were only with the folks that were on your evaluate, um, sorry, um, the only rotations you've been assigned to are to faculty who are also on your school committee, uh, at least at NUNM, I'll answer. And then um, Dr. Barnett and Dr. Garcia could maybe speak about how they would approach this at, at their institutions. But that's when you would ask residents. So um, sometimes people say, well, I've worked with, you know, these three attendings, you know, for almost six quarters. They know me really well, uh, but they're all on the committee. And I've only worked with this Dr. X once and Dr. Y this one other time. And so they can't speak to my skills as much. And I would say, that's okay. Still have Dr. X and Dr. Y do your evaluations because the, the whole reason why at NUNM we don't allow the evaluators to also um, write your, uh, also be in the interview committee and tr is because when they're on the in interview committee, they can already speak to your skill sets and they can uh, help rank you. Okay, so they're already an advocate for you sort of in the room if you feel like you are a strong performer for them. Uh, but if they write an evaluation for you, because you really don't have anyone else to write them. Uh, I mean, the scenario could occur, it'd be pretty rare, but it could occur. Um, they can still write for you. They just can't say anything in our ranking process. 
which is fine because they are still saying stuff about you in your evaluation. Um, it's just they can't really fight for you in the room. So they kind of have to recuse their self, themselves because they've already given their uh, evaluation of you. And that's why we ask folks to try to find someone else so that we aren't just hearing from the interview committee how they know you, but then we also see maybe how you interacted with other doctors that you knew weren't on the committee or, or something along those lines. So if it has anything to do with NUNM specifically that I didn't address, I'd encourage you to email me. But Dr. Garcia or Barnett, do you want to say how you would handle the situation at your institutions if it's different? I'll probably add to what you already said. That's pretty much similar to what we do on our committee level as well. We always encourage um, students to secure um, evaluations from faculty members that are not on, on the committee. And um, and the list doesn't only have to be limited to in-school um, supervisors. If you did, for example, advanced preceptorship outside of, um, you know, outside of the school and you did that advanced preceptorship for maybe a couple of quarters or three quarters, you can also have that preceptor, that advanced preceptor, or preceptor that you that you've worked with for several quarters, also create an, an evaluation for you. It's not really just limited to the adjunct or core faculty that you've worked with um, in the school. Um, you can also have um, um, non um, core or non adjunct um, clinical faculty to to create an evaluation for you. The key thing to remember here is this, um, you wanna make sure that you are going to be approaching an evaluator who can pretty much answer all the questions as, as much as possible to the, um, to the evaluation form. And that's why if you go to the documents library, there's a PDF form there that, that pretty much is um, a mirror image, if you will, of the, um, of the actual evaluations that we're asking your faculty to, to fill out. So you can see, at least have an idea of what those questions are. So if you're approaching a faculty say, oh, well, actually this faculty member only is able to answer five out of the 20 plus questions, even though you're, even if you're scoring like tens off the boards in the, uh, out of those five questions, it's not very helpful information. So I will really encourage you to just uh, think about the faculty members, the preceptors, the clinical preceptors that you work with who will actually be able to answer all, if not most of those questions. Because after all, this is a, this is a clinical residency. We'd like to have a good idea of your clinical skill sets. If your evaluators are not going to be, not going to be able to answer most of those questions, then it's not, it's not bad information, but it's not really that helpful information either. If that makes sense. Thank you, Dr. I was trying to say, oh. Yeah, are, are this similar too, and this relates to the question, uh, Dave, Dave, James' question uh, related to uh, recommendations that may not be clinical. Maybe they're in research or something else. Um, like what Gary said, this uh, they enter the survey is uh, structured so that you're comparing. Also, you're comparing you know, how how does this person rank in this regard and that regard to other students that you have. So how does that apply to research? Uh, how does that apply to maybe a preceptor that's not at the school that doesn't have a lot of other students to compare you to? So um, you start to lose that kind of um, the, the the fit of the um, of the of the uh, letter recommendation no longer applies the way it's supposed to apply if you start to deviate from the clinical uh, with other applicants to compare to. Thank you. Uh, so we have a few more questions rolling in. So I would just maybe try and keep our responses tighter so that we can get to all of the questions here. Uh, there's a question regarding residency application CV. So the ANMC's template and do you have to use that template or can you create your own CV if you already have one? I'll answer that question. Um... Just make sure that you follow the instructions. Um, the template is there as a guide, but at the same time, you want to keep to the page limit. Um, I, can, I just can't remember exactly what the page limit is now. I think it's up to five pages. So you have a, if you have a CV that's, say, 10 pages, you're going to be dinged for not following instructions. The, um, the template, of course, is just making it helpful for, remember, 
the residency committee is going to be reviewing a lot of applications and um, and it's easier for them to to look for the information in key areas that they're looking for and they're going to rely on that template so while your 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 cv may be standing out because it has tons of good information same time if the information that the that the committee member is looking for is not where it's supposed to be it may be challenging for that committee member to 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 score you appropriately so i would really highly encourage you to really just um, use that uh, use that as a guide and also just be mindful of the font size and of the page limit thank you dr garcia uh would somebody be able to comment to if you have completed NPLEX part two, uh, should you include that in your application? I, I can answer that. Um, you, you, we don't, oh, sorry, Dr. Garcia. We don't require it. Um, you do need to be licensable uh, to start the position in, in October. So uh, if you you had it, you could certainly put it in the same PDF to con to convey to the site director that you have already already passed both of those exams, and so you're not contingent upon that piece. But it is not required. It's not a required part of our application. Thank you. Uh, and there is another question about part time residencies. And are are there any part time residencies offered? If if not, how come? I can I can take that. That's specific to the CNME requirement. The CNME, uh, which is our uh, board of accreditation for uh, naturopathic medical education, has uh, only certified residencies as full time forty hours, forty to sixty hours a week. Uh, for a minimum of 48 full-time weeks within a 52 calendar year, 52 week calendar year. Um, so we are not able to shorten them um, less than 11 months. And we have to take into consideration PTO and uh, holidays, et cetera. Like at NUNM, you actually get about 30 days off throughout the whole year between 17 holidays and 13 paid days off. Um, so we're right there at that max of um, needing to provide 48 full-time weeks. And until the CNME decides to certify a part-time residency, we're not able to do that within the work week or within a truncated year either. Um, and so that's the reason why you won't find part-time uh, residencies offered anywhere um, just for that reason. That would be more of maybe seeking out a a mentorship or a part-time job after school. Thank you, Dr. Saunders. Uh, well, I'm not seeing any other questions coming in right now. So I want to thank our panel and, uh, and, and all of you for coming and being engaged in your residency process. Uh, this recording again will be sent out and uh, I'm super excited for this upcoming cycle. I wish you all the best of luck and uh, just keep on plugging away. You are doing great, you're on track and we are all proud of you. So thank you all for, uh, for being a part of this process and we look forward to hopefully calling you colleagues soon. So thank you very much for today. Thank you to the panel and I uh, look forward to seeing you shortly. <laughs>